click the bell icon to get latest videos from Ikeda. Hello friends, in today's session we are going to study about an entire process and this process is a manufacturing process of Portland cement. Portland cement is one of the most important engineering materials. It is the cement which is used for construction of buildings, bridges and many other things. And for all civil constructions, cement is an important part. Out of all the cements, Portland cement is extremely important and in today's session we are going to study the entire manufacturing process of it. Now this wet process manufacturing of Portland cement has different parts in it. It is carried out in different phases and steps. Let us see all the different steps one by one. Wet process manufacturing of Portland cement. This process involves the following major operations. The first is mixing of raw materials. We'll take different raw materials and we'll mix them properly. So let us see all the important raw materials. The first and the most important raw material is limestone for any cement. So limestones are crushed in a crusher and forwarded to tube mills to convert ground or fine powder to it. So now when I have limestones with me, limestones in a form of big rocks. So first I'll crush them into crusher into small pieces and then these small pieces will be fed into tube mills and once they're gone into tube mills this small pieces will also be crushed further into a very fine powder also known as ground powder so this is the very first phase of making the Portland cement taking limestone breaking the rocks into pieces and then further breaking the pieces into small powder which is further stored in storage tank known as silos Fine clay or shale is mixed with water for washing to remove organic matter if any is stored in. So now first I did with limestone and then I'm mixing my fine clay and shale together. Powdered limestone and washed wet clay are allowed to flow in a channel in the right proportions and led to grinding mills where they are mixed homogeneously to form a paste or a slurry. So now what do we do? We have two things together. The first thing was limestone which we have powdered. The second thing is the clay and the shales which are wet. Now we'll mix both of them together. We have to make sure that when we mix both of them it shall form a homogeneous mixture and form one paste or one slurry. And for that we do this process that is the second process now the second step is burning of raw materials now what were my raw materials i had limestone with me and i had my wet clay with me i need to burn them now burning of raw materials is usually in a rotary kiln which is made up of a steel tube we'll see the entire structure in the form of a diagram but as of now rotary kiln is a steel tube lined inside with refractory bricks now what are exactly refractory bricks refractory bricks are made of refractory materials and what are refractory materials refractory materials are such which themselves do not get affected by heat and they will make sure that the heat inside will not go outside and the heat outside will not come inside that means if I have a steel tube with me and this entire steel tube is lined with refractory bricks the bricks will make sure that the burning of raw materials inside the steel tube take properly because the heat which is maintained inside the steel tube will not go outside as well as the cool temperatures of outside will not come inside not only that these bricks themselves are very resistant to heat that means they themselves will not get burned up they themselves will not react at all at high temperatures as well so it is very important to line the steel tube with refractory bricks and rotating at a speed of 0.5 to 2 rotations per minute so in 60 seconds my entire steel tube will rotate either at 0.5 revolutions or 2 revolutions or 0.5 to 2 rotations now why does this happen if the steel tube is rotating that means at high temperature all my raw materials are getting the heat uniformly they are also mixing up together at homogeneous substances and materials and the paste which is formed will get burned up properly if the rotation takes place continuously second is the kiln is slightly inclined so that the material fed in at the upper end travels slowly to the lower end and firing at the discharging end if i'll have the steel rod which is vertical in nature if it is vertical then if i feed something at the top end will immediately come out at the lower end but i do not want this to happen i want that all my material which is there in the steel rod should remain there for a long period of time and if it has to remain for a long period of time the steel rod cannot be vertical it has to be in inclined at certain angle at certain degree and that is the reason why it is inclined at an angle 
you cannot keep it horizontally as well if i keep my steel rod horizontally what happens is if i put something at one end it will not come at the discharge end at all and that's the reason why it is in an inclined position neither vertical nor horizontal the kiln is supported by several tires which run on rollers and the kiln is driven by an ac cumulator motor the slurry gradually descends to the kiln into different zones of increasing temperature. Let us see all the different zones at increasing temperature which is there inside the steel rod. We will study all the different temperatures and zones of the steel rod as well as we will study all the chemical reactions which take place. Chemical reactions in various zones of a rotary kiln. With reference to the temperature, there are three zones in which various reactions take place. The zones and the reactions are discussed as below. The first is the drying zone. Remember when I have my limestone and wet clay together as my raw materials, they mix homogeneously to form a paste or a slurry. Now this paste and slurry will have a lot of moisture in it. And the first thing we need to do is remove the entire moisture content which is present in the homogeneous raw materials. And that's the reason why the first zone is the drying zone. The upper part of the kiln is known as the drying zone where the temperature is about 400 degrees Celsius. 400 degrees Celsius is enough for all the moisture content to evaporate because the boiling point of water itself is just 100 degrees Celsius. In this zone, most of the water is driven out of the slurry because of the hot gases. Let us see this in the diagrammatical format. This is my diagram of the rotary kiln. What happens over here exactly is this is the steel rod which is inclined at certain angle. The first zone is my drying zone which is at 400 degrees Celsius. Over here, this is what is marked over here. So I have my slurry passing in over here and as the slurry passes in, the first zone it will get in contact is with the zone and this is my drying zone. At 400 degrees Celsius, the entire moisture of the slurry will be removed. The second zone we have is the calcination zone and the central part of the kiln where the temperature is about 1000 degrees Celsius is known as the calcination zone. In this zone, limestone of slurry under goes decomposition to form quick lime and carbon dioxide which is later escapes out. Now what happens over here carbon dioxide is nothing but a gas and my rotary kiln is just an inclined tube so the CO2 can escape out from the either ends. The material forms small lumps called as nodules. The following is the reaction. Over here what is my reaction? There is decomposition of limestone. Decomposition of limestone into quick lime and carbon dioxide. That means on my reactant side I will have limestone. On the product side I will have quick lime and carbon dioxide which is given over here. It is a kind of reversible reaction because limestone is stable than quick lime. But it does not reverse back if the CO2, that means my carbon dioxide, escapes out. If I do not have carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide has already escaped out, CaO cannot turn back into CaCO3. Let us see the balancing of this equation. I have one calcium on the reactant side, one calcium on the product side. One carbon on the reactant side, one carbon on the product side. Three oxygens on my reactant side and over here also I have two plus one three oxygens on the product side. So this is exactly the reaction which takes place. Now let us see this zone in the diagram. Over here in the diagram the middle part at 1000 degrees Celsius is my calcination zone. Calcination zone is also known as calcine zone. It is a 1000 degrees Celsius and over here the limestone gets converted into quicklime and CO2. Now CO2 which is carbon dioxide will come out over here as flue gas. Flue gases are all the waste gases which happen during the different reactions happening inside the rotary kiln. So over here CO2 which forms after limestone getting converted into quick lime will escape out through this over here. The third zone is my clinkering zone. This is the lower part of the rotary kiln where the temperature is between 1500 to 1700 degrees Celsius and it's known as the clinkering zone. Now many reaction takes place in the clinkering zone. Let us look at them. Your lime and clay undergo chemical interactions that is fusion leading to various products as shown in the following reactions. Over here I have quick lime CaO which was formed in the middle zone of mine that is the calcination zone. Now in this zone there will be various reactions of my quick lime with SI SiO2 or Al2O3. Now what exactly is my SiO2 or Al2O3? They are all parts of my clay and shale. That means 
means they are parts of the wet clay and the wet clay will now have chemical reactions with my quick lime. So 2CaO plus SiO2 forms Ca2SiO4. Now this Ca2SiO4 I can write it as C2S that is dicalcium silicate. Now this is just a representation of dicalcium silicate. It's a symbolic form of it. So you just write C2S, C2S nothing but dicalcium silicate. Let us see the balancing of this equation. I have two calciums on my reactant side, two calciums on my product side. I have one silica on my reactant side, one silica on my product side. I have two plus two twice oxygen over here and O2 that means 2 plus 2 4 oxygens on my reactant side and O4 that means 4 oxygens on my product side as well and this forms dicalcium silicate which is also represented as C2S. The next over here is 3 CaO plus SiO2 forming tricalcium silicate. Now dicalcium silicate was represented as C2S. Now I have tricalcium silicate and that's the reason why it will be represented as C3S. Let us see the balancing of this reaction I have three calciums on my reactant side 3 Ca over here on my product side also I have Ca3 Ca3 on the product side 3 Ca on the reactant side the calcium is balanced 1 Si on the reactant side 1 Si on the product side the number of oxygens on my reactant side are 3 plus 2 5 the number of oxygens on my product side are O5 tricalcium silicate also is a balanced reaction represented as C3S. Finally I come over here where I have 3 CaO plus Al2O3 forming Ca3 Al2O6 which is also been represented as C3A known as tricalcium silicate. So over here I have 3 CaO plus Al2O3 let us see the reaction over here 3 calciums on the reactant side, 3 calciums on the product side. 3 plus 3, reactant 1 has 3 oxygens, reactant 2 also has 3 oxygens. That means 3 plus 3, 6 oxygens on my reactant side. Over here also I have O6, that is 6 oxygens on my product side. Finally, aluminium, 2 aluminiums on my reactant side, forming 2 aluminiums on the product side. Now let us see at the next reaction over here the product is what tetra calcium aluminoferrite. Tetra in chemistry is 4 that means I will have 4 and that's the reason why it is over here represented as C4AF. Now why do I have F because over here I am also using iron that is ferrite. Therefore C3AF is a symbolic representation of tetra calcium aluminoferrite. Let us see the reaction over here. I have 4 CaO plus Al2O3 plus Fe2O3 forming Ca4 Al2 Fe2O10 and this entire structure, this entire molecular formula is known as tetracalcium aluminoferrite also represented as C4AF. Let us see the balancing of this reaction. On my reactant side, how many calciums do I have? I have four calciums over here as reactant one. In reactant two, I do not have any calcium. In reactant three also, I do not have any calcium. That means on the entire reactant side, the number of calciums in all in total are four. On my product side, I have just one product and that's the reason why I'll just calculate the number of elements in that very product. The number of calciums over here are also 4. That means calcium on the reactant side and calcium on the product side is well balanced. Now let us see the number of aluminium. Al over here is 2. That means in my reactant 2, I have Al2. In my reactant 1, I do not have any aluminium. In my reactant 3 also, I do not have any aluminium. That means in my entire reactant side, the number of aluminium is just 2 which is present in my reactant 2. Now on my product side, I just have a product and I will see the number of aluminiums present in it and over here I have Al2 over here. That means that my aluminium on the reactant side is balanced with the aluminium on the product side. Moving further, let us see iron. I have Fe2 on the reactant 3. Ferrous is not present in reactant 1 or reactant 2 either. That means in my entire reactant side, I have two ferrous, that means two iron molecules. On my product side also, I have Fe2, that means the number of iron on the reactant side and product side are balanced.
Now for oxygen, let us first calculate the number of oxygens present on the product side. Over here, I have 10 oxygens already present on the product side. That means I should have 10 oxygens present on the reactant side as well. Let us count the number of oxygens present on the reactant side. Over here, I have 3. Over here, I have 3 more. That means 3 plus 3 is 6. And over here, I have 4 O's. That means 6 plus 4 is 10. On the product side I had 10 oxygens on the reactant side I also have 10 oxygens and that's the reason why this entire reaction is well balanced. The aluminates and silicates of calcium then fuse together to form small hard grayish stones called clinkers. Now let me show you this entire process in the diagram. Now in this rotary kiln of mine the last phase or the last stage the bottom most phase is known as my clinkering zone it is at 1500 to 1700 degrees celsius and all the reactions we just studied happen in this zone but there are no flue gases over here formed because we just saw that everything from C2A, C3A, C4AF and there were no byproducts of gases. With just one product, the entire balancing of the equation was being done and there was no byproduct needed. And that's the reason why the only flue gas we'll get was from the second phase that is the calcination zone and that is CO2. In my third phase, there are many reactions which take place but there are not much byproducts. The third process is the grinding process. Over here we have seen that whatever we get after the second process are small hard grayish stones called as clinkers. But we see that our cement is paste and very fine powder. That means I will have to make sure that this entire structure of stones is now pulverized. That means it's converted into fine powder like formation. And that's the reason why we have this third process of grinding. The hot clinkers discharging from the kiln is cooled by various systems such as planetary coolers or rotary coolers. In the coolers, clinker is cooled with atmospheric air. The cooled clinker is then powdered to 2 to 6 percent of gypsum. So now whenever I have to cool it, I'll first make sure that whatever my products were from the discharging end, they came out of 1500 to 1700 degrees Celsius. So first thing we do is we cool all the products. After the products are being cooled, we powder them. And while powdering them, we mix them with gypsum to provide good strength to that cement. Now the last and the final process is the process of packing. Once we have made the entire cement, it is very important for us to pack it properly or else it will get decomposed by all the atmospheric gases and the moisture. And that is the reason why packing is one of the most important processes while in the manufacturing of Portland cement. The ground cement is stored in concrete storage silos. Moisture free air compressed air is used. Why do we have moisture free? Because we have taken that cement to 400 degrees celsius just to remove all the water content which is present in it and now we do not want the moisture from the air to get back into it and that's the reason why whenever we are air compressing we have to make sure that the air we use is moisture free cement and keep it from compaction by its own weight further it is fed to automatic packing machines usually cement is packed in jute bags each holding approximately of 50 kg of the cement so finally once the entire packing process is done it's packed into jute bags and in jute bags they have approximately 50 kg cement in it so in this session we studied about the wet process of manufacturing portland cement we saw all the different phases of it there were four main phases the first was mixing of raw material second was burning of raw materials third was grinding of raw materials and finally packing them together in the form of cement we studied each and every phase in details with the help of diagrams and reactions as well thank you so much for watching this video stay tuned to ikida and subscribe to ikida